All right. Welcome, everybody. So our speaker today is Robert Young from NYU. And uh, he will talk about metric differentiation and embeddings of the Heisenberg group. Thank you very much for coming and please go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, so yeah, so, so, so I, have my, I, have my, I have my slides here uh, and you can get them at this URL. That should work uh, if you want a copy of the slides to follow along with. Um, and so, yeah, so, 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 so I want to talk about uh, metric differentiation and embeddings of the Heisenberg group. And, um, and basically I wanna talk about two things today. I wanna to try and convince you of two things today. One, uh, the Heisenberg group is the simplest non-abelian uh, Lie group, or at least it's arguably the simplest non-abelian Lie group. Uh, and I wanna talk about the effect that has on the geometry. I wanna say, I, I want to talk about um, the, the, how it's hard to embed the Heisenberg group into Bonnach spaces because Bonnach spaces are commutative or abelian, uh, but Heisenberg group is non-abelian. And so I want to talk about what, what effect that has. And I want to talk about um, how that changes with different Bonnach spaces, because it turns out that one, uh, good embeddings of the Heisenberg group into, into Bonnach spaces have to be sort of bumpy. They, they have to be uh, complicated uh, because of the non-commutativity, but uh, different Bonnach spaces admit more complex uh, maps than other 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 than other Bonnach spaces, and so you can see a little bit of the geometry of Bonnach spaces by looking at uh, which Bonnach spaces let you embed the Heisenberg group uh, better or worse. Okay, so um, probably should start by defining the Heisenberg group. Uh, the Heisenberg group is a three-dimensional, no-potent Lie group. Uh, you can write it as the group of three by three, three upper triangular matrices with ones along the diagonal, x, y, and z above the diagonal like so, where x, y, and z are real numbers. Um, that gives you a Lie group. Uh, and inside that group, you can construct a lattice. Uh, the integer Heisenberg group where you have all the, which is the, the, the group of integer three by three matrices with this structure. Uh, and that's generated by elementary matrices X, Y, and Z, uh, such that X, the, the commutator of X and Y is Z, and X and Z commutes, and Y and Z commutes. Uh, and so that's the, that's the group theory of the Heisenberg group. That's the, uh, the, 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 that's the algebraic structure of the Heisenberg group. Uh, what does the geometry look like? Well, you can, start, you can one way to look at the geometry is to look at the, uh, the, the Cayley graph of this lattice, look at the geometry of this lattice. Uh, so this is the Cayley graph of the integer lattice. Uh, this has one vertex for every element, for every lattice point in the Heisenberg group. And it has one edge uh, whenever you can go from one, one element to another element by multiplying by a generator. And so there are three different generators. So we have uh, these red lines correspond to multiplying by x. If you multiply by x, it increases the x-coordinate by one. Uh, these blue lines correspond to multiplying by y. If you multiply by y, it increases the y-coordinate by one, but it also changes the z-coordinate. You can see that they tilt as you go from left to right. And these black lines, these vertical lines, correspond to multiplying by z. If you multiply by z, it increases the z-coordinate by one. And you can see the, the relations that showed up on the previous slide, you can see them in the Cayley graph because X and Z commute. If you multiply X, Z, X inverse, Z inverse, you get back to where you started. Uh, y and Z commute. If you multiply Y, Z, Y inverse, Z inverse, you get back to where you started. Uh, but X and Y don't commute because if you start at the origin and you go X, Y, X inverse, Y inverse, you end up with a spiral like this. You end up one step above where you started because the commutator of X and Y is equal to Z. It's okay. So these spirals show up all throughout the group. Uh, so for instance, if you multiply X square, Y square, X to the minus two, Y to the minus two, it's easy to check to do the calculation that, that gives you Z to the fourth. If you multiply, uh, x to the n, y to the n, x to the minus n, y to the minus n, that's going to move you n squared steps up in the z direction because you can calculate z to the n squared is x to the n, y to the x, x to the minus y, and y to the minus n. Uh, and those spirals have a strong effect on the geometry. 
uh, they affect the geometry in a couple of ways. Uh, so first, all these spirals are really scalings of one another. Because we take this little spiral and we scale the x-coordinate up by a factor of two and the y-coordinate by a factor of two and the z-coordinate by a factor of four, we get this bigger spiral. If we take the whole lattice, oops, if we take the whole lattice and we scale the whole lattice by a factor of two in the x-direction, a factor of two in the y-direction, a factor of four in the z-direction, we get this uh, finer lattice. We get a subdivision of our original lattice. Uh, and as n increases, if we scale by n in the x direction, n in the y direction, n squared in the z direction, as n increases, we're going to get finer and finer lattices in, uh, in the Heisenberg group, finer and finer lattices in R3. Okay? So that's one way that, this, that the spirals show up. They, 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 they illustrate this scaling property that the Heisenberg group has. The other thing that these lattices do, or sorry, the, 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 other, the other thing that these spirals do is that these spirals are more efficient ways to travel vertically in the Heisenberg group. Uh, because, well, if we start with our small spiral, it's not a very efficient way of traveling in the Heisenberg group because it takes four steps to move up one unit in the z direction. But if we multiply by two, it takes two, four, six, eight steps to move up four steps in the z direction. If we multiply by four, or if we multiply by n, then you can go n steps, n steps, n steps, n steps. So that's four n steps along the spiral and move up n squared steps in the vertical direction. And so when n is large, that path length four n is the most efficient way to move vertically in the Heisenberg group. Uh, you can move quadratic distances vertically or quadratic, yeah, quadratic uh, distances vertically along paths of length four n. And so, in particular, if you look at points that are far apart in the graph, if you look at, say, a point over here and a point over here in the graph, then the shortest path from here to here is going to be mostly horizontal edges, mostly these red and blue edges. Because if you have some path from here to here that has a long vertical segment, if it has a lot of vertical segments, then you could replace that with a big spiral. And so there's a uniform bound on the number of vertical edges in a shortest path in this graph. Uh, it's at most, you know, 20 or so vertical edges because anything bigger than that, you could replace with a big spiral. This is, is this okay so far? Are there any questions about anything so far? Okay, so now we wanna go from the graph to the group. We wanna go from this graph to the, uh, to, 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 we would want to go from this metric on the graph to the metric on the Lie group. Um, and so, well, we can use this scaling. If we take larger and larger scalings of our lattice, um, we're going to get finer and finer uh, lattices. And, and as n goes to infinity, we're going to get finer and finer and finer lattices. Uh, in the limit, our lattice is the entire Lie group, and we can define distances on the lattice and look at the limit to get a distance on the Lie group. And that distance ought to satisfy two properties. One, uh, because we constructed it using this n by n by n squared scaling, the lattice, the, the, the new metric ought to inherit that n by n by n squared scaling. And two, uh, because this new metric is the limit of these metrics on the graphs, we would ideally like to be able to say that shortest paths in the metric on the Lie group, the shortest paths in the limit are limits of shortest paths in the graphs. And we know that shortest paths in the graphs are mostly composed of red and blue edges, are mostly composed of horizontal edges. So if we take a limit of shortest paths in the graph, it only has boundedly many vertical edges. Those vertical edges are getting shorter and shorter, getting smaller and smaller as n increases. And so in the limit, we should end up with a shortest path which has no vertical edges, which is entirely made up of horizontal edges. And so those two properties that, you know, shortest paths should just be uh, composed of horizontal uh, edges and that we should have this n by n by n squared scaling, that's, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's a sub-Riemannian metric. Uh, in particular, 
So a sub-Riemannian metric is like a Riemannian metric in that it's, it's defined by, 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 by assigning lengths to vectors in your manifold. But what makes it sub-Riemannian is that some of those vectors can have infinite lengths. Uh, at each point, you have a subspace of the tangent space, which is called the horizontal subspace. Uh, and you have a Riemannian metric on that horizontal subspace, or you can inner product on that horizontal subspace. And then any vectors that aren't in that horizontal subspace are taken to have infinite length. Uh, just like a Riemannian metric, you define the distance between two points. Uh, so, so in this case, the horizontal uh, spaces are the spaces that are spanned by the red and blue edges, or the spaces that are spanned by the horizontal directions. And just like a Riemannian metric, you can define the distance between two points in terms of the length of a shortest curve between those two points. The only difference is that because some of our vectors now have infinite length, the shortest curve between the, the in order for a curve to have finite length, it has to stay in these tangent spaces. It has to always be uh, the, the, the tangent vector always has to be horizontal. If so, we can use the metric to define the length of that curve. That cur a curve where the tangent is always horizontal is called a horizontal curve. Uh, we can use the metric to define the length of horizontal curves, and we can define the distance between two points to be the infimal length of a horizontal curve from one point to the other. Uh, and uh, it's important that this, this metric is finite, that we can get from any point to any other point by a horizontal curve. But the way we constructed this distribution, the, the, the horizontal planes, the red edges and the blue edges, the horizontal edges of that graph are all horizontal. Uh, they're all contained in these planes. And so any horizontal path in the graph is a horizontal curve. And so you can connect any two vertices in the graph uh, in fact, you can connect, you know, any two vertices in these uh, scalings of the graph because if you if you take this 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 these, these, these planes and you scale them by n by n by n squared, it sends horizontal vectors to horizontal vectors, and it stretches all the horizontal vectors by a factor of n. Uh, so you can connect any point to any other point, basically by using paths in the graph. Furthermore. Uh, like I said, um, the, the scaling map, the, the, if you scale x by t, y by t, z by t squared, it's going to send horizontal vectors to horizontal vectors, and it's going to scale them by a factor of t. So it scales the whole metric by a factor of t. And that lets us, that lets us describe balls in the metric because, well, the ball of radius epsilon is the unit ball scaled by a factor of epsilon. The unit ball is approximately a one by one by one box. So if you scale it by epsilon by epsilon by epsilon squared, you're going to get approximately an epsilon by epsilon by epsilon squared box. And because of that, that means that all the vertical lines in this picture have Hausdorff dimension two. Because if I want to take this unit segment and I want to cover it by boxes where all the boxes have height epsilon squared, I'm going to need epsilon to the minus two boxes to do that. And so that's going to give me Hausdorff dimension two for these vertical lines. Is this OK so far? Are there any questions about any of this so far? Okay. Yeah, like, feel free to, 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 you know, feel free to stop me if you have a question. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so the, the, but this gives you a picture of the Heisenberg group. The trouble with this picture, though, is that it isn't very geometrically accurate doesn't really reflect the distances in the Heisenberg group because of this fact, because every vertical line in the Heisenberg group has Hausdorff dimension two. This picture you know, draws all the vertical lines as lines. They have Hausdorff dimension one in this picture. So this is not a very good picture because it doesn't reflect the structure of those vertical lines. And so it's natural to ask, OK, can we do better than this? Can we embed the Heisenberg group into Euclidean space in a way that preserves the metric? And it turns out the answer is no. Uh, this is the theorem of Fonsu and Sems, um, that there is no bi Lipschitz embedding from the Heisenberg group to Rn. Uh, and this follows from a theorem of Fonsu that every Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group to Rn is Fonsu differentiable almost everywhere. What that means is that if you have a Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group to Rn, then for almost every point in the domain, if you take a sufficiently small ball around that point, then the restriction of the, of, of the map to that small ball is close to a homomorphism. Uh, and that 
Uh, and, and, and that leads to this non-embedding result because, well, if you have a homomorphism from a non-commutative group to a commutative group, uh, it has to kill the commutator subgroup. And the commutator subgroup of the Heisenberg group is this is these vertical lines, is, is, is this Z direction. So every Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group to Rn looks like a homomorphism at sufficiently small scales, but those homomorphisms collapse the vertical direction, collapse the Z direction. And so this is important. So, so, so let me so let me get so, so let me try to explain. Uh, why this happens, why you get this differentiability, because it really boils down to, um, to, to the, 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 this picture in terms of these, the, these horizontal lines. Uh, the, the, the Heisenberg group is in fact foliated by horizontal lines going from left to right parallel to these red lines and horizontal lines going from front to back parallel to these, uh, these blue lines. And so if we have a Lipschitz map from if we have a Lipschitz map from the Heisenberg group to Rn, I want to claim that this actually has to collapse the metric, that it, that it, that it can't preserve the metric. Uh, and so what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's take one of these, one of, one, let's, let's take one of these red lines going from left to right, and let's look at the image under the Lipschitz map. Uh, the image under the, under the Lipschitz map is going to be some curve, some Lipschitz curve. Um, because it's because of Rademacher's theorem, we know that if you have a Lipschitz curve, it's differentiable almost everywhere. Uh, that for most points on the curve, uh, if we look at a sufficiently small scale around that point and then blow it up, we end up with something that's very close to a straight line. Right? The Heisenberg group, though, you don't just have one. Uh, horizontal line. Well, you don't have, only have one red line, you have a whole family of red lines. You have a whole horizontal foliation uh, that's parallel to these red lines. So if we do some measure theory, we can show that in fact, uh, we, we, we don't just have differentiability on each individual curve, but if we do a little bit of measure theory, we can actually find a ball in the Heisenberg group uh, so that all of the red lines going through that ball map to lines in Rn, I guess not exactly lines because this is we, 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 all we can say is something approximate, but we, can, but we can find a ball where all of the red lines in that ball map to curves in Rn, which are close to lines. And in fact, because all these curves are close to one another, they have to be close to parallel lines. Uh, so we can find a ball where all the red lines in the ball map to nearly parallel lines in Rn. And in fact, we can go further. We don't just have that red foliation. We have that blue foliation going from front to back. We can ask that all of the blue lines in the ball also map to uh, lines in Rn that are close to parallel. But once you have that, the metric has to collapse. Because in the Heisenberg group, we have these spirals. In the Heisenberg group, you can start at a point, you can go in the x direction, the y direction, the x, back in the x direction, back in the y direction, and end up above where you started at a different place than where you started. But then if you look at the image of this curve in Rn, you're going to start at some point, you're going to go out along the red curves, you're going to go out along the blue curves, you're going to go back along the red curves, back along the blue curves. you're going to get a parallelogram or something very close to a parallelogram. And so the two endpoints of this spiral map, which are far apart in the Heisenberg group, map to two points in Rn, which are close together, that vertical line has to collapse. So if the, so, 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 so if the, 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 the curves in the foliation are sent to curves that are too smooth, uh, if, you're, if, if the curves in the foliation are too differentiable on a ball or too close to lines on a ball, then the metric in that ball has to collapse. Is this okay so far? Okay. So that's why, that's roughly why there's no Bilipschitz embedding from the Heisenberg group into Rn. Um, and so, well, if there's no bilipschitz embedding, we can ask, what's the best we can do that's not, uh, what, 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 what's the best we can do? 
Uh, specifically, we can ask, uh, for instance, how well can we embed pieces of the Heisenberg group into Hilbert space? Um, and there is a result. Uh, this, is a, this is a special case of Aswad's embedding theorem. Aswad's embedding theorem applies to uh, doubling metric spaces. I'm just going to apply it to uh, the Heisenberg group here. But if we take a finite subset of the Heisenberg group, uh, say we take uh, the ball of radius r in the integer lattice, that's a finite subset. It contains about r to the fourth uh, points. Um, then, well, any finite subset can certainly be embedded in Hilbert space. Um, and a Swartz embedding theorem says that, in fact, there's a map from this finite subset to Hilbert space, uh, which satisfies this inequality. So on one hand, the map is distance decreasing. Uh, the distance between f of x and f of y is at most the distance between x and y. On the other hand, it doesn't decrease distances by too much. It doesn't decrease distances by more than a factor of one over root log r. Uh, and so a map like this, we say a map like this has distortion on the order of root log r. And smaller distortion means it preserves, means that it preserves the metric better. Um, and so how do we construct a map like this? Well, one way to think about it is that the argument we just made about the red lines and the blue lines, about these two foliations, means that if a Lipschitz map is too smooth, if it's too differentiable on, the, uh, on, 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 on these horizontal lines, then it's going to collapse the metric somewhere. So one way to think about this is that in order to get a nice embedding of a subset of the Heisenberg group, a nice embedding of this ball, it can't send horizontal lines to curves that are too smooth. It has to send horizontal lines to curves that are bumpy. Uh, for instance, uh, how do we construct bumpy curves? Well, one thing you can do is a Weierstrass type construction. Uh, you, can, you can draw a curve like this by defining a bunch of functions that oscillate with different frequencies. Uh, so here, this has wavelength about two to the k, uh, wavelength through the k minus one, all the way down to wavelength one. Uh, each of these coordinate functions is uh, one Lipschitz. So if we want to have a function where, 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 where the coordinates are like this, and we need to normalize by a factor of one over root k in order to make the whole function one Lipschitz. But if we do that, we get a curve like this. Uh, this is a curve which is about one over root k bumpy at k different scales, because if I take any point and I take a ball around that point of radius two to the i, then the ith coordinate of this map is going to be far from a, far, is going to be far from an affine function. And so uh, the, 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 the restriction of this curve to the ball of radius two to the i is going to be about one over root k away from a, uh, from a line. Uh, so we can use this construction to construct curves that are about one over root k away from a line at about k different scales, about all the scales between one and two to the k. And we can't really do much better than that, uh, basically because of the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, the Pythagorean theorem tells us that if we have a curve uh, like that, and we want to perturb it so that it's not, so that it's epsilon far away from a line, if this is say length one, and we want to perturb it by epsilon, uh, so it's epsilon far away from a line, then that new curve, uh, that new curve is going to have length about one plus epsilon square. Uh, perturbing it epsilon away from a line at one scale costs us epsilon squared length. And so if we want to perturb at many scales, we want to repeat that. If we want to get another epsilon away from a curve at the smaller scale, and another epsilon away from the curve at the smaller scale, and so on and so forth, each time we do that, it's going to cost us another epsilon squared length. And so the most we can do is we can bump it about 1 over root k away from a line at about k different scales. Um, and so, OK, if this is the bumpiest curve we can construct, how do we construct a map from the Heisenberg group to Rn so that every horizontal line maps to a curve that's roughly like this? Well, that's Aswad's embedding theorem. Um, if you construct uh, a sequence of maps, let's call them sigma i, 
uh, from, from the Heisenberg group to Hilbert space, where each map is one Lipschitz, and each map has amplitude and wavelength about two to the i, like these coordinate functions from the last page, like two to the i sine x over two to the i. And this is not; these are not too hard to construct. Uh, one, thing, one thing you can do is you can take the the, the Lie group, take the quotient by the lattice. Uh, that's a that's a closed three manifold, and that closed three manifold certainly embeds into Hilbert space. If you do that. That's a good candidate for sigma for sigma zero because it, 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 it's going to it's going to have amplitude about two to the i, and if you have two points that are that are in the same fundamental domain of the, the lattice, then they're going to map to two points in Hilbert space that are separated by at least some minimal distance. Uh, and so that 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 that, 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 that lets you construct sigma naught, and then you can use the scaling to construct all the other sigma i's. But the important part of all these sigma i's is that all the sigma i's are one Lipschitz, and sigma i does a pretty good job of separating points that are distance about two to the i apart. If you do that, then you can just combine all those maps together to get one map f. Uh, because each of the coordinates is one Lipschitz, we need to normalize by root k to get a map which is one Lipschitz. But that map then embeds the ball of radius r into L2 with distortion on the order of root log R. Because if you have two points inside uh, the ball of radius R, inside BR, then on one hand, uh, these are both inside the ball of radius R. So they're at most distance 2R apart. On the other hand, these are two points in the integer lattice. Uh, and two points in the integer lattice are at least distance one apart. And so if you have two points in the ball of radius R, then they're going to have distance about two to the i between them, which means that they're going to be well separated by one of these coordinate functions, by the ith coordinate function. And so the, 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 this is the distance between their images is going to be about uh, two to the i divided by root k. You're going to have distortion on the order of root k. And because we need to, we, because we have k different scales, we have log r different scales in the ball of radius r, that gives us distortion on the order of root log r. Is this okay so far? So then this sends each horizontal line to a bumpy curve, to a fire thrust type curve. Uh, and just like we said that the, these fire thrust type curves, these curves that are, that, are, that are one over root K bumpy at K different scales are the bumpiest curves you can construct. This is the best embedding you can construct. It's a theorem of Austin, Noah, and Tessera that any embedding of BR into L2 has at least this much distortion. And so this gives us a, a lower bound on the distortion. Uh, the existence of this embedding gives us an upper bound on, this, on the distortion. And so we say that the ball of radius R in the lattice has L2 distortion on the order of root log R. So this is a nice sharp quantitative estimate. But it only applies to the Hilbert space because, because we, use, we, we use the Pythagorean theorem. In other Banach spaces, well, you don't have the Pythagorean theorem. So we can ask what happens, for instance, in uh, LP. If P is bigger than two, then we no longer have the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, uh, in, in, in LP, if I do the same, I, if we do the same sort of thing, if I take a, a segment of length one and I add a bump to it, so that's epsilon away, from a line, that's going to increase the length now by a factor of uh, one plus epsilon to the p, if p is bigger than two. And so we should expect to get embedding. And so, 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 so that's, if p is bigger than two, that, 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 that's, a, that's a smaller increase than we had over here. So we should expect to be able to produce bumpier curves. And thus, we should expect to be able to produce nicer embeddings. And in fact, that's what happens. If we do exactly the same construction that we did for L2, except we uh, do it in LP, then we can do the same thing. We, we, we have these one Lipschitz functions uh, with amplitude and wavelength on the order of two to the i. Uh, we can construct a map f by setting each coordinate to one of these functions. And each of these coordinates is one Lipschitz. So in order to make the whole thing one Lipschitz, we normalize by a factor of one over the pth root of k rather than the square root of k. And that gives us a map with distortion on the order of the pth root of log r. Uh, 
we get bumpier curves, we get bumpier embeddings, we get a better, we get we, a we lower distortion. Uh, and again, this is up to a constant, this is optimal. Uh, it's a theorem of Laforgue and Nor that any embedding of the ball of radius R into LP has at least uh, pth root of log R distortion. It's okay so far? Okay. So we can draw a picture, we can draw a graph. Um, the, 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 the distortion exponent of BR looks like this. Uh, if we want to embed BR into uh, L2, it's going to take root log R distortion. If we want to embed it into LP for P bigger than 2, it's going to take P root of log R distortion. And so as P increases, this distortion gets smaller and smaller, which kind of makes sense because we know that any metric space embeds isometrically with zero distort or with, with distortion one in uh, L infinity. And so it kind of makes sense that as P goes to infinity, this distortion is getting smaller and smaller. We're getting better and better embeddings. Natural to ask, what happens when P is between one and two? It turns out the distortion actually plateaus. Uh, the distortion between when P is between greater than one, less than two, the distortion is like root log R. And this is really a consequence of Dvoretsky's theorem. Uh, this is really, uh, it, it turns out that the, the reason we have this plateau is because uh, Hilbert space is always the hardest space to embed in. Uh, Dvoretsky's theorem tells you that any infinite dimensional Banach space almost contains a copy of Hilbert space. And so if you can embed with root log R distortion in Hilbert space, then you can embed with root log R distortion in any infinite dimensional Banach space. And so we get this plateau here because of Dvoretsky's theorem. And that just leaves one exponent, which is what happens in L1. Uh, oh yeah, so, so, so that plateau is, is also a result of Laforg and Knorr. Uh, that just leaves what happens in L1. And it turns out that what happens in L1 is that we have a discontinuity. It turns out that there is a embedding in L1 which is better than this Weierstrass style embedding that, 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 that has distortion uh, fourth root log R rather than root log R. And so, and that, and, and, and that has some nice consequences, including the following, uh, which is that, 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 that there's, a, there's a metric space based on the Heisenberg group that embeds by a bilipsis map in L1 and a bilipsis map in L4, but not in any LP space in between. Uh, basically, what you can do is um, the, 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 the ball of radius R embeds with fourth root log R distortion in L1. And so that means that if you take the metric on the ball of radius R and you distort it by a factor of at most root log R, or fourth root log R, you get a metric space that embeds by Lipschitz in L1. It turns out that if you do that correctly, that metric space also embeds in L4, but it can't embed in any LP space in between because you've only distorted the metric. You've only changed the metric by a factor of fourth root log R. Uh, you have, a, in order to embed it in L2, say, you would have to distort it by an additional factor of fourth root log R. Uh, and so you get a metric that embeds bilipsely in L1, bilipsely in L4, but it has at least this much distortion in uh, any LP space in between. Is this okay so far? This is probably so. so, so this, this, this is roughly the 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 the, the, the so, so this is roughly the first part of the the, the talk, which is um, trying to the, 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 this idea that that, that, that embeddings in uh, that, 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 that embeddings of the Heisenberg group have to be bumpy in this way, and that you have and that you have these lower bounds coming from the amount of bumpiness that each Banach space supports. Uh, but this is, so, so before I move on to the next part of the talk, which is to try to construct this map here, to try to construct this fourth root distortion map into L1, are there any questions about the first part? I have one uh, short question. You mentioned these bilipsis embedding, and now you have this log R there. Does it mean that you can do holder for every holder below one? Uh, so C alpha embeddings by C alpha embeddings? Uh, Just trivially, I, because you have the log R only? I think so. I, what, 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 what you can do, um, yeah, so, so uh, I, I, 
I, I, I think that's true because like this, this root log R distortion, this is, this is very small and this is growing very slowly. So the, 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 the pairs of points where this distortion is realized are always the vertically separated points. Uh, the, 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 the thing we're trying to do is, is, is we're always trying to introduce enough separation in the vertical direction to, to minimize the distortion. And so, yeah, so, so, certainly if, you, if, if instead of the Heisenberg group, if it's, so the standard metric on the Heisenberg group is like uh, norm X plus norm Y plus root norm Z. If you replace that square root with like, you know, uh, the power of one half uh, minus epsilon plus, epsilon, I can't forget, I, I, whatever the sign is, then, then, I, then, then, then that, that should be possible to embed. Okay, okay, thanks. More questions? Okay, so yeah, so so like I said, the 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 the, the, the so, so, so the the second thing I want to talk about today is I want to try to construct. I want to try to explain what why, where this discontinuity comes from. Try to explain what happens in L one, uh, and so the first thing that happens in L one is that this argument that we've been using this whole talk for no longer works uh, because. We've been relying on differentiability of maps from uh, di differentiability of Lipschitz curves in LP, but Lipschitz curves in L1 don't have to be differentiable anywhere. Uh, the standard example is this: that if you have the map from the interval to L1 functions on the interval, which sends f of t to the characteristic function of the interval from zero to t, then it's easy to check that this is an isometric embedding. Uh, but, it, but it can never be approximated by a linear map. There's nowhere where this function is close to a linear map. In the terminology we were using before, this is, this is, this is bumpy at every scale. It can never be approximated by a linear map. And so the arguments we were using that relied on differentiability no longer work. On the other hand, this suggests a way of constructing maps that's completely new. Uh, they, they, they're constructing maps to L1 that we couldn't do in LP, which is, well, this is a map that sends every point in the interval to some zero one function on the interval. Let's try to do something like that. Let's try to, let, let's, let, let's look at maps that send um, points in the Heisenberg group to zero one functions on the Heisenberg group. And because we have this group structure, we may as well do that equivariantly. Uh, so let's define, uh, so, so, so if we pick a subset of the Heisenberg group, uh, we can define a corresponding map to L1, which sends every point G to the characteristic function of some translate of our set. Uh, and if you do that, then it induces the following left invariant metric. Uh, the distance between FSP and FSQ is the measure of the set of elements in the Heisenberg group. So that if you translate, uh, either GP is inside S and GQ is outside, or GQ is inside and GP, me, and GP is outside. These, these, these are the measure of the set of elements of the group. Uh, so that if you translate P and Q by that element, one of them lands inside the set, one of them lands outside the set. Um, this is a little bit, uh, this is a little bit, uh, Part of it, so, 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 so to help, so this is a little bit tricky to get a handle on. So let's 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 try this with a particular example. Let's try this uh, with some concrete set. Let's take the ball. Uh, let's take the unit ball in the Heisenberg group, and let's try to look at what this map does to the unit ball. Um, so, like I said, the distance between f of p and f of q. If I have two points p and q, the distance between f and q, uh, between f of p and f of q, is the measure of the set of translates of P and Q so that one of them lands inside the set or one of them lands inside the set and one of them lands outside. And so we can try this with some, some with a couple of different families of points. So here's my set D, it's the unit ball in the Heisenberg group. And let's take, for instance, two points that are separated by a long horizontal segment like that. So let's start by looking at P and Q like this. If I take this P and Q, and I translate them by some g, then these two points are far apart. So any translate of them is go are going to be far apart. And so I can't get them both to be inside the ball of the unit ball. I'm going to have some set of translates where one of them is inside the unit ball. I'm going to have some set of translates where the other one is inside the unit ball. 
And so no matter how far apart they are, if they're sufficiently far apart, that's going to be all the translates that I care about. If these are sufficiently far apart, if the distance between P and Q is large, then the distance between F of P and F of Q is on the order of one, is on the order of the measure of the unit ball. If I take two points that are a little bit closer together, uh, let's say P and Q are separated by a short horizontal curve. So if P and Q are separated by a short horizontal curve, like so, uh, if this is distance T, say, now I have to worry about cases where the translates are both inside the ball. Uh, and in fact, uh, well, if, if, I, if, I, if I want to look at translates of P and Q, where one of them is inside the ball, one of them is outside, that's the same as looking at translates of this segment that cross the boundary of the ball. So that's going to be ones that cross, say, the, the, the right edge of the ball, like so, ones that cross the left edge of the ball, like so, and that's a, and that's it, uh, because so so, so it's, I'm going to have one set of translates along one edge about that size, and one set of translates around the other side so edge about that size. The measure of those sets is on the order of t, and so if I have two points separated by uh, about t in a horizontal direction, then the distance between the images of those points is on the order of t, which is great because the distance between p and q is on the order of t. So this does a pretty good job at separating points that are, that are close together and, and, and separated by a horizontal curve. On the other hand, if I have two points that are close together and separated by a vertical segment, I have the same argument. Uh, I have p and q separated by some vertical segment. Uh, again, I am looking at the measure. Let's, let's draw another quick copy of the unit ball. Um, I'm looking at the measure of the set of translates of this segment that cross the boundary of the ball. Again, that's going to be on the order, uh, the measure of that is going to be on the order of T. So if P and Q are separated by a vertical segment of length T, then the distance between FDP and FDQ is on the order of t, but now that's a problem because if that's if t is less than one, then the distance between p and q is the square root of t rather than t, and that square root is going to be bigger than t. Uh, so if I have two points that are separated by a short vertical curve, then those two points collapse under this map uh, because the distance between their images is on the order of t, the distance between the original points is on the order of root t. So this map does a pretty good job of embedding horizontal lines, but it collapses vertical lines. Is this okay so far? So how can we do better than this? Well, what we need to do is we need to, to look at sets, uh, we, our, our set, uh, basic, basically, uh, the problem is that our set does a pretty good job of, uh, uh, of separating horizontally separated points. It, it crosses a lot of horizontal segments, but it doesn't cross enough vertical segments. So we need to change our set so it intersects about the same number of horizontal segments because the, 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 the horizontal segments are separated just about as much as they need to be but more vertical segments. We need to, we need, we need, well, in the plane, we could just do something like this. We could, we, we, we would have a long skinny set like this where it crosses, you know, about the same number of horizontal segments, but many more vertical segments. In the plane, this would be great. Unfortunately, what we have is the Heisenberg group and we can't do that in the Heisenberg group. Uh, if, 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 if I tried to do that in the Heisenberg group, if I tried to, to, to take instead of like the unit ball, some long skinny ball going off to the side, well, because of the, uh, because of the, 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 the tilt in these blue lines, those blue lines are going to cross that long skinny ball many, many times as we, as we increase the X coordinate. Uh, and so, we, we, so, so in order to do this in the Heisenberg group, we need to do something different in order to get a surface that cannot cut as many vertical lines and as few horizontal lines as possible. And it turns out that what we can do is we can take vertical surfaces, uh, say we take this plane on the left side here, this, this is the, uh, the YZ plane, and we can perturb them. Uh, we can take vertical surfaces and perturb them. Because if we take this surface 
and we and we turn it instead of a plane, we turn it into a graph. Then it's still going to intersect about the same number of red lines. If we do this carefully, maybe we can arrange for the blue lines to mostly go along the graph rather than transverse to the graph. Uh, and if the graph is wiggly enough, then it's going to intersect a lot of vertical lines. So we can try to construct surfaces by, 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 by perturbing vertical planes. Uh, it turns out that the best way to do that is to take this vertical plane and kind of uh, introduce ridges along the horizontal lines. Basically, you, you end up with a, you end up with a sort of zigzag. Oh, uh, I did not tr try this beforehand, but you, you end up with you end up with something like this. You end up with a uh, uh, you, you have you, 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 you have your plane. You perturb to add uh, ridges along the, the horizontal lines. What you end up with is a sort of surface like this, where you have a lot of vertical lines crossing the surface, because if I take a vertical line, it's going to go in and out of all these ridges. But as long as we stay relatively close to our original vertical plane, uh, the horizontal lines are going to go mostly along the ridges. Uh, they, a, 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 on the original plane itself, the horizontal lines are just going straight across. If the, y, if the x coordinate increases a bit, the lines are going to tilt a little. And so they're going to cross through the ridge. But not too badly. Uh, and so as long as we have a relatively small perturbation, and as long as that perturbation, uh, as long as the bumps in that perturbation are stretched out along the horizontal lines, we're pretty close to optimal. And that's exactly what we do. Uh, we take a surface, uh, we take a vertical plane, we add a bump. That bump affects the horizontal lines, adds some tilt to the horizontal lines, which you can see in this center figure here. And so when we add more bumps to on top of that, to get to cut even more vertical lines, we have to make sure that those new bumps are, are aligned with those, 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 those horizontal curves. They, they, they also have to tilt. Uh, and then the horizontal lines are tilting a little bit more at the centers of those new bumps. So when we add another layer, uh, those, those new bumps have to be tilted a little bit more than the previous layer until what you end up with is a picture like this. Uh, you have a uh, you, you, you have a surface with a lot of bumps that are laid out along horizontal lines, so that if you have a straight line, uh, it mostly goes. If you have a horizontal line, it mostly goes along the bumps. You can imagine just a, uh, a, a, a horizontal lines in the direction of these bumps. But if you have a vertical line, it's going to go in and out. It's going to go. Uh, it's going to cross many of these ridges. It's going to cross many of these bumps. Uh, if you do this carefully, uh, you can add a layer of bumps of depth epsilon, which adds epsilon to the fourth of the perimeter. And so you can construct about log r layers of bumps, which let you separate all the scales involved in the unit ball. Uh, and each layer has depth on the order of log r to the minus one quarter. And if you put together the embedding, you end up with an embedding with distortion on the order of fourth root log r. Uh, and so that's the that's so that, so that, that that's essentially the construction that if you if you if you, if you construct a sufficiently bumpy surface you can turn it into a nice embedding of the heisenberg group into l1 um you can then ask okay is this the best you can do and it turns out it is this is up to a constant the bumpiest possible surface in the heisenberg group and so up to a constant this is the best embedding of the heisenberg group in l1 this takes a fair amount of work to do uh, it's based on a couple of decompositions. First, uh, that you can decompose an arbitrary surface in the Heisenberg group into what are called intrinsic Lipschitz graphs. These are like Lipschitz graphs, like graphs of Lipschitz functions in Euclidean space, except they have to take into account the, 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 the geometry of the Heisenberg group. Uh, specifically, these are graphs which vary relatively slowly in horizontal directions. This is an example of an intrinsic Lipschitz graph. And you can imagine if you were walking along this, along one of these ridges, they, they, they doesn't change very much. But if you're walking from top to bottom, you're crossing all these ridges and all these valleys, the, 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 the function is changing very rapidly. And then furthermore, because of the non-commutativity of the Heisenberg group, the, the direction of the ridges depends on where you are in the group. You can see that this ridge has relatively smaller slope than this ridge because it's at a different altitude. And likewise, this ridge is a little bit more tilted uh, than, 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 than those, again, because of the change in altitude. Uh, and so the first decomposition decomposes arbitrary surfaces into surfaces like this. 
The second thing we have to do is analyze these intrinsic Lipschitz graphs. And it turns out that these intrinsic Lipschitz graphs can be broken down uh, into quadrilaterals that are also aligned with the horizontal, uh, that are also aligned with the horizontal curves. Uh, and again, I, I don't have time to, I don't have time to, to, to give a rigorous definition, but the basic idea is a picture like the, the ones we use to construct this bumpy surface. Uh, you start with one big quadrilateral, then you can decompose it into a bunch of smaller quadrilaterals that are as best as you can aligned with the uh, horizontal curves. You can decompose those into smaller quadrilaterals, which are again, as best as you can, they're aligned with the horizontal curves and so on and so forth. And you can put bounds on the number of quadrilaterals and the shape of the quadrilaterals that imply that the surface is no, no it, 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 at most as bumpy as, as this surface, as the surface we constructed. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. So let me just sum up. Uh, the, base, the, the upshot is that maps from the Heisenberg group to Hilbert space and in general to uniformly convex vec, uh, Bonnach spaces are often governed by the differentiability or the bumpiness of curves in that Bonnach space. But maps from the Heisenberg group to L1, because L1 doesn't have Rademacher's theorem, it is not, doesn't have the Radon Nikodem property, uh, maps to L1 are governed instead by the shape of uh, surfaces, by the rectifiability and the bumpiness of surfaces in the Heisenberg group. And since you can construct these extra bumpy surfaces in the Heisenberg group, you can get nicer embeddings into L1 and into L2. And so a natural question is, okay, how does this generalize to other groups? Uh, how does this generalize to, to other spaces? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Right, come on.